Okay. Let's see if this is working. Okay. Let's see if this is working. Yep, it seems to be working. <laughs> All right. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, I'm just going to be streaming uh, real quick. Well, all right, let's put it this way. I need to preface what's going on here. I'm, I've, so I've been working in Niagara for a while now, and you know I'm a, kind of a UE4 generalist at this point. I've, I've, I've been dipping my toes into just all the different pools uh, for the sake of finding things that I enjoy doing, for the sake of pursuing those things, and hopefully eventually getting some some job uh, <laughs> related to those things in the future. But one of the things I've been doing is is Niagara and and uh, like some of the many things that I've noticed I enjoy one of them is Niagara and so I've been working in Niagara for a, for a while now and uh, one of the projects or one of the little challenges I guess I gave myself was to create um, you know a realistic explosion um, something that would be great for a video game or just kind of generally that kind of stuff um, in Niagara, one of the, and here, let me uh, kind of show you guys, but uh, something akin to Battlefront uh, 1, and um, and this is because I was working on a, a mod called Star Wars Incursion for a while, and so I uh, was wanting to do some Niagara effects specifically for that as well, um, but if you look on the left side more specifically not the right side we're not going to focus on the right side at all um this is battlefront 2 and i think generally universally people agree that the battlefront 1 effects were better anyway so i've specifically used the battlefront 1 effects as far as my reference goes um and and i gotta say that i definitely agree that battlefront 1 is better because you could see that like there for whatever reason <laughs> there's seemingly like no emissive on battlefront 2 it's kind of funny i don't quite understand what they're doing there but anyway i think whoever did the battlefront one effects was far more uh <laughs> versed in the vfx industry for sure and, and more capable but anyway 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 look at on the left side <clears throat> just focusing on this this was kind of what uh largely i was referencing for my explosion or i just wanted to at least use the techniques that were used in the battlefront one explosion here um in my explosion and, and, and test out trying to recreate it the best I could, or, or at least to the extent that, um, you know, I've used the techniques properly in order to uh, replicate those kind of things. So you can kind of see um, explosion goes off, lots of cool detail. I'll talk about all the individual parts more, but that just kind of gives you an idea of, of one of the things that I was largely looking into. Um, and so, and I got a couple other tabs there, I'm sure you saw, but we'll go into that later. And so, um, just to start off, here is the final product. Um, and I'll zoom zoom up, and so there you go. So you can kind of see, um, there's plenty of things that could be ironed out. <laughs> there's plenty of stuff that could be ironed out. And, um, you know, brought up to a professional quality, but I'm not trying to perfect this explosion i'm just trying to get it to a state where once again like i said i was using the techniques that i feel like were used by a professional in the industry um and and be able to use those here and uh the the curve of tweaking in order to make this perfect is not a curve i'm trying to ride right now i'm just trying to get this effect to a a point where i think it's very good and works for demonstration purposes specifically for this stream and and for everybody out there and so i hope that this video it's probably going to be an hour or two because i'm going to go over everything <laughs> that i took to do this but i hope that this video is is uh helpful to just um help people gain a better understanding of how to do this if they also want to get into niagara and build their own effects um but you know i hope it also shows off some of the cool things that i was able to achieve because i i love to kind of show that stuff off as well um but yeah i mean you could see and so if we just look at this and here let me uh let's just alt p real quick and and i alt p because i can slow down time um and i have a little blueprint for that but uh, we can just go ahead and slow down time and you could see these individual 
um, emitters, which we'll also just individually look at too <laughs> later on. But you can see all these things. So um, if we speed up again and uh, slow down, it should explode in just a minute. But you can see we've got a flash. We've got the, kind of this fire. We've got lots of rocks uh, being thrown out. We got dust. We've got the distortion. You can see that coming out. We got smoke. Um, and so we, we've got all these individual pieces that are necessary to create an explosion. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've referenced, and I'll go ahead and show this off too. Um, I already showed this Battlefront 1 part, and this is that was a large bit of my reference material. Um, another video that I've looked at, and this is a great video if you guys want to go and see it, how to real-time VFX, uh, I... M-A-F-X or whatever, his channel. But he just has this nice 10-minute video, and it goes over just the individual elements. Not exactly how to do them, um, at least I don't think so. Um, but he goes over very briefly what's necessary to create an explosion. And so it's just great to know those individual elements, um, which I, you know, incorporated. The one thing I didn't use is he has a, uh, and, and I think he showed it off right, uh, right here, but you have a decal that's placed on the floor, I think, and I haven't actually checked it in Unreal 5. This is actually something I got to look at. In Unreal 4, oh, so by the way, and I got to, I, I should preference this for the timestamp here. Unreal 5.0.1 came out a few days ago. And so this, that's the current version of Unreal I'm in is 5.0.1, which came out a few days ago. Um, so that's a timestamp that in. Inevitably, five um, Unreal, just normal five, came out probably a couple weeks ago. Um, but in Unreal 4, um, the, what do you call it? Sorry, the decals for Niagara, I think, were experimental. So Niagara being able to spawn decals and manipulate them. I think that was in an experimental state with um, Unreal 4. I haven't checked that in Unreal 5, so I don't know if that's been improved at all um, or if it's out of experimental state. But that's one of the reasons that I specifically did not have a decal in my explosion. So I'm just explaining that off real quick. Um, but back, I guess, to the video. So this is just a great video that goes over all these individual elements, and he does it in Photoshop so you can just kind of see it. Um, but yeah, great video. One of the things I love to reference too um, that I've just looked at while I made this was just Sparks. <laughs> this is a little uh, VFX, Artist Reacts from Corridor Crew, uh, which I love. These guys have been following for a long time. Um, but just this this small clip, I, mean, I can play that for you, but you can kind of see just this explosion and then bright sparks fly out and just the individual um, element, like the individual sparks and how they react when they hit something and how bright they are when this um, explosion originally goes off, and then how they start to slowly dim. And you can see the smoke um, that kind of pops up there um, in the middle. Um, all these things are really cool, and I just love to look at them. These are these are a couple of the references I got. Uh, you could see where some sparks fly out here, and I just love to look, take the moment to look at the individual sparks and see how they react. And um, inevitably, you know, these are all kind of <laughs> you know tv charges there this isn't necessarily realistic but but it's it's the hollywood realistic which is what we all try to emulate for the sake of that's what people are used to seeing um and so just really cool and so these are some of the things that i just referenced and i wanted to show those off right at the start here so you can reference these too if you're just getting into it and you don't want to watch the whole video here's some cool reference material okay now I'll talk about my, <laughs> specifically my experience and, and, and some of the things I've made. And so I started off, when I, when I started to approach this kind of thing in this um, effect uh, that has all these individual elements with creating the emitter bases. And so I wanted to create individual bases um, that I could use for anything in the future, right? But, uh, but I, so I'd have an understanding of everything inside of them. Um, but inevitably I'm, I'm going to put them together for this one big explosion project. Uh, and here's the materials over here, <laughs> but, um, let's go ahead and, and, and just 
Actually, we don't need to look into the individual emitters because let's just open up our system, uh, which has got all the emitters in there anyway. So explosion one, open that up. And uh, I did most of this work in Unreal 4.27, and I literally just moved the project over to Unreal 5, like right now, for the sake of showing you guys in Unreal 5, the uh, Niagara effect, just because I assume most people are working in Unreal 5, so it'd be easier to just have all the UI be the same. Um, there's no reason to use <laughs> 4.27, the older one, uh, for this necessarily. Um, but anyway, so let's let's just start out here. So the first part of this explosion, let's isolate this, is the flash. And this will loop every five seconds, just FYI. But you'll see that it's just this brief, brief flash that goes off. And can I uh, expand this for you guys? Just doing these individual parts, geez. Uh, but you can see this brief flash that will go off every five seconds. And it is exactly that. It is that small. Um, and as we look in here, you can kind of see that you know, it's it's got a 0 0.07 lifetime. And so one of the big parts of an explosion is that brief flash that goes off. And it's and it just, what do you call it? It, it, it uh, invokes, symbolizes, it, mean, it, it signals to our brain that something uh, instantaneous, immediate, and something powerful has happened. And so the, every explosion you'll notice has that big flash. And it's extremely brief, but it's this giant flash that just you know, gets across that something crazy has just happened, something big has happened. And so this is pretty straightforward. This is just a particle. And uh, for every, and I'll, every I, so I have an instance here of a material that I've made. Um, but every particle here, may mind you, also has, if I go to the particles, you can see that I have individual uh, materials that I made myself for the sake of um, doing this. But anyway, so I'll go into that in just a sec. Um, you see, I just have a super simple color, a little bit yellow, mostly white. Um, and I have a dynamic material, which I'll go into once again when I pull up the material. Um, but just, you know, basically nothing. Basically nothing. It's just the particle, extremely quick. Um, you know, put a size to it, whatever matches the explosion inevitably. And uh, that is, that's literally it. Spawn instantaneous one, call it a day. Um, going into the dynamic material, I have emissive and the opacity, uh, which is programmed into the material, uh, using the dynamic material parameters. And so let's open up our, not the flash instance, because that's going to bring us, actually, can I get the parent from there? Yeah, I can. So anyway, flash instance of the M flash parent. And you can see <laughs> the material for flash. It's absolutely nothing. It's just a texture um, with the particle color multiplied. Um, and then just multiply that for our dynamic um, parameters, which are going to be in, well, you know, like you saw it just in our emitter. And then that just goes into our emissive and opacity. This material is, you know, just a surface additive unlit and uh, two-sided. But uh, actually, if it's facing camera, we might not need it that two-sided. But anyway, that's fine. And so I use this dynamic material uh, kind of node here. Um, basically in all of my mats that I've done. And I don't know if there's a better way to do this, but it's it works perfect for me and what I'm doing. Um, inevitably, this is a kind of four-pronged um, kind of, how do you say, it? just a single integer for all these. And so it, it's a color, you know, it's, it's supposed to be um, kind of this color input, but I've used it as a individual integer input so I can control specific things like omissive and opacity um, because all I have to do is you know grab the dynamic parameter node bring it into the material and then when I'm in my uh, emitter I can literally just plus and add that dynamic material parameter and it'll grab it straight from the material that is placed on my sprite and so it's all more or less automatic in that regard. And so that's why I've used the dynamic uh, parameter um, in this way in all my uh, materials for all of my <laughs> emitters. I don't know if there's a better way to do that. I don't know if there's a way to have infinite kind of these dynamic parameters that I can just easily bring into my emitters. But nonetheless, I've just used this one node. It's got four prongs and it's 
it it does more than I need so far. I haven't needed more than four dynamic parameters so far, so <laughs> I've never needed to look up a different solution. This works perfectly fine, at least for me right now, right? If you needed five dynamic parameters, you know, then then there'd be a problem. But uh, so far, it's it's worked fine. Um, and admittedly, just as a tangent, there has been um, times when I needed some color and I needed some other things that would be nice if they were dynamic like these can do in my emitter but admittedly I've just circumvented that by doing it manually you know and and just putting it into just assigning that manually in the material in one of the instances and then calling it a day you know so four dynamic inputs has serviced me well so I don't really need to <laughs> I've never needed to worry about that too much anyway that's information to preface the fact that that's in all of my materials basically if you could see this um dynamic material um does this one have it it's kind of hard to see there it doesn't have it there um is that mesh base it doesn't have it there but dynamic material here and then should be dynamic material here as well so i use it a lot i use that a lot obviously um but the flash that's all that you need to know about the flash super Super quick. I mean, flash is easy, um, but extremely important. Uh, don't worry about it. Okay, so let's isolate our next part. And we're kind of, I guess I could have prefaced this a little bit better, but basically we're going to go down this line, and then I'll go into um, kind of the ones on the sides here. The ones up here, this is just the smoke and fire itself. Um, and then these are kind of the more effects-based things down here. Uh, so we'll go through this line, and I'll explain all these. So sparks out of the way. Let's do the ring distortion that you saw there. Um, and we'll isolate that. Uh, I think we can leave that enabled because that's isolated. Okay, so you can see this. Um, and, oh, is this, I guess that's enabled, so we'll just turn that off. I guess I can enable and disable them. Do that itself. Uh, but anyway, let's see if this is a... Uh... Enable that, but I guess turn off isolated. Huh. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. I thought isolate, anyway, I, I work in some other stuff, so nonetheless, isolate just uh, does that for individual. Okay, ring distortion. So let's zoom out here, and you can kind of see this ring distortion effect that's happening on the left side here. And very specifically, it is ring distortion. You could have normal distortion, right? And you could have it as a, as a texture or anything like that. You could have it in any shape, form you want. I mean, this is materials, right? Um, but this is specifically ring distortion. I say that to the extent that uh, I have made a material named that. And I have also made a material called uh, just normal distortion. And we could see in here, let's see. M, so we have ring distortion instance. Uh, M ring distortion right here. And then we have the, I think it, we should have M, M distortion. So this is just kind of a normal distortion, which admittedly I didn't use in this explosion. This distortion would be something like a heat distortion that comes off of fire. Um, and I'll um, probably, I'll go ahead and have this open. I'll go into it when I go over ring distortion because I want you guys to be able to see that too. So ring distortion, you've seen that. Um, you can see it on the explosion as it, goes off uh, <laughs> even though I isolated it um, but right here it, it's it's really simple so I just spawned one of these right it's one particle and uh, it's it's really interesting because because this distortion and the ring distortion are probably the most advanced materials I've ever created myself uh, or have endeavored to create and it's one of the more um, advanced just materials I've done the emitter itself is pretty simple right like I said one particle here um, pretty simple, give it a lifetime, 3.5, everything else is unset. And so, extremely simple particle. The particle scale, though, as you can see, I mean, just on the left side, it's increasing in scale. So we have it start at super simple um, kind of variables we're working with. Starts zero lifetime normalized age, of course, and then starts at one, the, the original size that we assigned to it. And then it'll increase exponentially. So it goes to 2,800 is what I have it at here. Um, and inevitably, all these parameters I adjust for the sake of whatever makes the explosion look the best. Like I said, you could tweak these things. All, all these things can be tweaked in all my you know, emitters and all my materials. But anyway, 
<laughs> I tried to make everything as dynamic as I could. Um, but this just increases in size exponentially, and then dynamic parameter, right? And so in this case, I've got, um, instead of the emissive and uh, opacity that I had in the last one, in this one I have power, and I have um, just kind of, <laughs> you can see it, it's pretty simple. Um, but put max particle size here. And this is because the material is going to take this information, the max particle size, and use that to basically calculate against the increased size in order to maintain the ring size of the uh, material or the texture. Or, sorry, or the, yeah, the material as it increases. I guess you could say the particle or texture. Who cares? <laughs> as this particle increases, we're going to try and maintain the ring size. Because, you know, if the, if the particle increases from 1 to 2,800, the ring size would be ridiculously huge. I mean, you'd have just some crazy variables you'd have to, um, I mean, it just, it'd be nuts, the sizes you'd have to work with. Um, and so the way I did it is I, I grabbed this, this end size, however large you want your particle to be, and then I calcul do a bunch of calculations against the particle in order to maintain the size of the ring as it expands so it doesn't turn into this giant ring but it maintains kind of the similar size and we'll go into that later i'll show you the that in the instance but that's just so you know what that's for um so let's go into the instance sprite render pull up our instance ring distortion and and you can see just some of the the parameters uh, we've got going on here um and so this actually is this uh in four point in unreal four uh, this is live, so you can see the actual distortion, but for whatever reason, it's kind of frozen in time, seemingly, right now, so I'm not sure how to, um, I'm not sure exactly how on Unreal 5 at the moment to this, let me get that, there we go, perfect, okay, so you can kind of see that it is moving, um, and it's distorting everything there, let's go into why that's uh, happening, uh, let's go over these parameters first, and then we'll kind of describe them. So, pull this up. So, decrease thinness with particle size. And so, this is exactly what I was just talking about with how you how I was doing calculations with the max size against the ring in order to maintain its its ring size. So, decrease thinness with particle size. So, it says one equals one hundred percent of the particle size to use to decrease the thinness. And so this is at 9.5. And that just means that the the original size of the ring is maintained to an extent of 95%, basically. If I turned this down to 0.5, then that would mean as the ring increases in size, it would maintain its original ring size only half percent. So only 0.5%. And so I, you can see here why I maintain the original ring size 0.95%. So almost the original size is almost entirely maintained, but it does allow the ring to, to expand to a, a little bit, uh, to a small extent. But so that's what I was just talking about. This is one of those parameters. And then the second one is inner hardness. And we can kind of see, um, so that's inside of here. Basically, this inside part of our ring distortion here will be either soft or hard. So that's what that is. Normal speed... That's almost a given. You can kind of see it's pretty slow here, 0.2, but we can speed that up to 1. Now it's really moving. <laughs> but the normals uh, kind of dictate how, how the reflection comes through. Um, and so you can kind of see that, that the normals um, do, do affect that there. Um, and then outer hardness, it's exactly what you think it is. Outer hardness is the outside hardness of the ring, which is at 0 0.5. And so... I guess we could maybe increase that a little bit here. So you, <laughs> now you can really see it, um, the the ring shape. But yeah, so the outer hardness is that. Let's put it back to, um, so the uh, 0.5 hardness you can kind of see there. Let's put it back to negative uh, 0.5 there. And then uh, refraction amount. So this is the actual refraction. This is the actual... Um, how do you, how do you, it's not reflection, clearly, um, but it's how much the thing's getting distorted. So it really is, let's, uh, maybe if you could kind of see the tree, but it's how much the light's getting pulled through there. Um, 
because the normal is how it looks, but the actual refraction is a separate thing. And so we have it at negative 50 right now. I'm not sure if we can change that and it will. Okay, so there you go. And you kind of demonstrate that where zero is, is zero. Um, we can bring that back to negative 50 real quick. My computer isn't slow. There we go. Um, or whatever you do on that. Okay, so you can kind of see that where the fraction amount does change that. You increase it super hard, decrease it super hard. Um, I admit, it, it's been a little while since I've um, done a ton of work on this project. I just recently did the fire and smoke, but this it's been a while since I've looked at, since I've worked with my uh, reflections here. So <laughs> some of the stuff, I might need to refresh it myself, but I'll do my best. Refraction from normals, and so this is this is a thing that I programmed in where the normals, literally the normals here that we we talked about, um, can influence that refraction. And so this basically says, and I, and I wish I did a tooltip on this, but this will basically take the normals and have that be uh, the part of the refraction there. And you can change whether the refraction is completely by itself, and there you go. <laughs> Refra ref uh. Sorry, I'm losing my words here. Refraction without normals. And you can really see how refraction works when you do this. Um, refraction just completely by itself. All right, and it looks like a black hole almost practically. Um, and then you have the, when you have the normals come in to influence it, that's where you start getting some of the kind of heat distortion-esque look. So there you go. Um, let me kind of, I think I was at one before, but let me. Just control Z to get back. <laughs> Looking a little weird. All right. Um, and then the last one is just thinness. And so this is the actual, um, like I was talking about with the thinness right here, decreased particle thinness. This is the the ring thinness. And so we can increase and decrease this. This is at 0. 0.6, but if we bring it down, you'll see that the ring slowly, slowly gets bigger and larger. Um, moving inward and um, if we bring it thinness increase the thinness it gets thinner and so the the ring gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until the ring is very very thin you can almost not even see it and so that's what that is and so if we go into our parent here and this these distortions might take a while a little bit because they are some of the more complicated things but they're, they're actually very simple um, and you can really see that I've, I've done I think I've done a good job at simplifying the different individual parts here um, so let's just start off with the, with the top and then it kind of compounds inevitably but get normal noise we want and so all we're doing is getting our normal texture samples right and a lot of the textures and materials uh, sorry a lot of the textures and a couple of the meshes that I use in this explosion are just from other free marketplace unreal effects packs and I've brought them in here some of those textures and, and, and materials uh, sorry uh, and meshes <laughs> and, and then use those as you can kind of see in particles here I have some of those uh, smoke textures some of these I use some of them are just here um, but those noise textures like we got a noise distortion here and a couple things here um, heat tiles there and so I've just used kind of free marketplace stuff for the for uh, putting together those things I didn't make the textures myself <laughs> um, or the meshes myself, but you know, that's that's so I can learn Unreal and circumvent some of that stuff. Um, so going into here, I wonder, so this is just heat tile. Yeah, so this is just heat tile, and uh, these are just some texture samples. The reason why you kind of look in here and the picture of the normals look different is because we're actually um, literally going into the tiling here into the texture coordinates, and we are tiling it differently. And so if we, and I think um, maybe if I just... Well, I don't. I, I can't go into every individual thing that much. I I need to kind of go a little bit quicker here. <laughs> this is going to take forever. Um, but I'm just getting two normals and basically laying them over each other to to create this this almost difference in uh, in how the normal moves. So if I had one normal and it would just move upwards vertically, that's nice. But if I have two normals, then I can have almost this this kind of diagonal upward and horizontal movement. Um, I'm sure there's a way to move one normal vertically, but once again, having two normals allows it to kind of have these different shapes going through. It just adds a lot more depth to it. Um, and, and you can see that because I just add them together at the end here. But I'm just getting these texture coordinates, tiling them differently, and then having a panner 
um, and having these panners speed um, kind of defined here a little bit, but then I get the normal speed, which you saw in the, in the instance, and that's what's multiplied times this kind of um, manual definement in order to have this, these different speeds of these two things. Um, the reason why they're manually defined as well right here is just because the, the speed at which something rises and the speed at which it might go to the side, you know, do this horizontal movement and the vertical movement, realistically, those speeds do have almost these, a, a set speed to them. And so that's why I wanted to have a set speed that made it look realistic. And then I could change how fast that speed was moving along um, with the normal speed here. So that's all this is, is, is we do all this stuff, get the normals we want. Um, and we can maybe just preview this by itself. We'll see if it blows up. So there you go. So you can see what I'm talking about, where you have this vertical and then kind of this horizontal movement. You can see that coming to the left there. Um, so that's what that is. So we get the normals we want. And then, <laughs> and then that pretty much goes straight into a multiply node for our power and then straight into our normals there. And uh, we can actually, we just want to preview what that is. We'll load up there. So there's our normal power. I think this is at uh, 1. Um, default values. There we go. Yeah, so it is at 1. But you can see if we decrease our power, let's do 0.5, that the normals, uh, well, actually, do the, I think they should. Maybe that has to do more with the uh, fraction amount. <laughs> but the normals slowly start to go away, right? And so that's one of the parts of this um, of this thing disappearing, is the normals need to go away. If the normals are, are continuously um, large and, you know, if the normals continuously look like this and, and exist, the, it'll be visible in, in engine and, and in the game. And so in order for you to have this disappearing effect with this refraction, you have to have the normals go away as well. You notice that there's there's nothing plugged into opacity here. Like opacity is irrelevant in this scenario. Um, and this is a big thing that I had a lot of trouble with originally. And I'm just gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here and, and talk about it because you can't have this distortion. And, and, and one of the things about this explosion, um, and you can kind of see it here because we've isolated the distortion, is you notice that the distortion has, it, it fades away. You see on the sides, it fades away. And it has to have this smooth, um, you know, disappearing. It has to disappear smooth, it has to look smooth. You can't just have it pop out of existence, right? That's a given. But easier said than done, of course. Because <laughs> what happens is that opacity isn't uh, necessarily super relevant to doing that. I don't think it's relevant at all. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly the effect that opacity has on ref on um, refraction, but I think the opacity of the effect doesn't do almost anything, if anything at all, to the light refracting through this. And so if I decrease the opacity, it does nothing. Um, but we can maybe even, let me try and jog my memory here, because I don't think that'll stop previewing that. Um, I don't think it'll change the effect. It's gonna load real quick. We compiled, can we see it now? Where is it? <laughs> well, it's at zero. Okay, so the opacity's at zero, yeah, but. Let's see, does that give us it back? Take that out. Or is our power at? Uh, yeah, power's at one. Now the real question is, was I able or ever able to see it? <laughs> Just tripping. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I wasn't able to see it here specifically. Because um, I can't remember. Can't remember anything for jack squat. <laughs> Let's. Uh, oh yeah. Anyway. You'll just have to take my word for it because I'm not going to try and, and go through. I can't, I can't stay in one spot, guys. There's too much to get through here. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to test all that stuff out, you can um, on, your, on your own time. But, but, but that's my experience with that, is that the opacity, I can't have a smooth decrease from one 
to zero when it comes to opacity and refraction. It won't be smooth. It's not going to happen that way. And so you actually have to, and that's why I call this power, is because it's not an opacity-based thing is, is, the, is the way that this fades out. And it's really the power of the normals and the power um, of the uh, refraction are being decreased at a rate to have it fade out instead of having opacity just determine whether something goes away. So anyway, that's that's that. Um, so that's just this straight normals to normals kind of thing here. Let's bring the normals down to this and let's talk about this. <laughs> so um, to start off, I guess we'll start from um, this this multiply node here. And uh, let's see if we can get the preview going. Okay, so maybe I was just really freaking far away. Let's, I, I actually want to check if we can see that again here. So you can barely see that. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I won't go back into the opacity, but there we go. Um, so let's go, let's go into this bottom part here. Start previewing. And you'll see that now we've you're, we've got our normals here but now we've got all this other cool stuff applied now we've got our donut our donut that we wanted our ring that we wanted and so let's kind of figure out how we did that and so down here we've got the get desired mask and apply it and so that's pretty straightforward i'd say what we're doing is we're getting uh, our sphere masks and we got two of them as you can see because we have an outside sphere and then we have an inside sphere um and I'll just show you uh, them individually, but so we get our texture coordinates, we get our, our we have our outer hardness, and so this is the outside sphere. And then we've got our inner hardness, this is the inside sphere. And so we get a texture coordinate, and then we do uh, 0.5, and then 0.5 um, for our kind of radius, so that'll determine that. Um, and I think that's the, I don't remember exactly where that is for the radius, but anyway, let's preview it. This thing will load. It's take. <laughs> I don't know. It takes so long to get these things, um, but you can kind of see that we've got our our literally just a white circle. This is this is all it takes to get this first mask. Is just a white circle. Um, texture coordinate 0.5. The 0.5 is this actually you can put in a because it's a texture coordinate. You could actually do a a two integer and plug that in there in order to just throw the circle around. But anyway, I won't go into sphere mask. You can learn about that by on your own. Um, but that's what this is. We get our first mask. That's the outer one. And then we get our second mask. That's the inner one. All right. And then we multiply them together, and that's how you get the uh, our mask there. Um, this earlier part, this is the decreased thinness with particle size. So this, these are those calculations that I talked about in order to maintain the ring size while the particle increases. And so this is what we're doing here. And, it's, and it pretty much says that right there. As we increase size, decrease the thinness for the sake of maintaining our original thinness to whatever percentage we specified here with our decreased thinness particle size. So that's all this is. Um, thinness as well, that variable's right here. This goes straight into our uh, kind of smaller uh, circle radius. As you could remember uh, with the instance, as we... Um, as we increase the thinness, it gets literally thinner to the outside edges. As we decrease it, it increases to the point where it's full. Um, and so that's all that is. And then, so that mask, it's applied to our normals. You saw that. And then we come into here. So this is kind of these finishing touches here. And so get masked normals and use them to influence refraction if we want. And so this is that part in the instance here where we say refraction from normals, which we don't have to do, but we can. And so all we're doing is basically we're splitting up the normals or we're splitting up the, the components here. And let's add that. Let's preview that. And then we add them together. So we're getting a black and white version of this original mask. And then we're bringing that in here, option for refraction to come from normals. And this is this part. So refraction from normals, and or so refraction from normals here, and then refraction amount. And so refraction from normals is literally just plugged into a lerp, which will decide um, whether we actually take 
the refraction from our normals here. And so we get our, our, get our, we get our normals, split the components, turn it into black and white, then multiply that for our refraction, and then that would be put into um, our refraction here. And so that those normals are put into black and white, which then get used in the refraction, obviously, uh, <laughs> or more or less. Um, or we don't use the, the normals for our refraction, and it lerps, and we just take the B. And so the normals aren't used, and it's just the refraction amount that gets used, um, you know, in line with our, our masks here. So that's all that is. Bring it to here. Uh, white uh, fall off or refraction. And so this just does a little sub um, subtract. Um, and the white fall off, if I'm trying to remember correctly, is that we basically make all the edges white. Um, I think it's the case here. And so that allows uh, for the fall off, which is you know part of our power here as, as we decrease it. Um, to basically not, how, how it, I wish I had better words, um, but it has, it has the, the, the fall off needs to be white because that's the, I think the zero amount for refraction. Refraction, as you see, this is where things get difficult. I mean it. Opacity, because uh, white is, is one. White is represented in one. Um. And so opacity takes in one and it's full. And you could see it. Opacity with, with black or zero, you can't see it. I, if, if I remember correctly, the refraction amount is actually the opposite. Um, or it might be that zero is when you... Huh, I'd, I'd have to remember, but I know that refraction... I, I kind of wish I reviewed this a little bit before I started, but... I looked up refraction and it's got an interesting value set to it, which is half the reason that you see in here where I have refraction amount is negative 50. It's not a uh, normal 50 or anything like that because I think the, the refraction direction is based on whether it's negative or positive. So my assumption presently, being ignorant, having worked on this in, in a month or so, is that zero for refraction will have no refraction. But... Um, we might have to check up on that. <laughs> but anyway, I, I convert this to white. I think the edges get converted to white. And we could just, I'm just going to look at here. Let's preview that. There you go. So the edges are all black. And then here, I use, I just have one and uh, subtract that from one. And so now all the edges are black and we still have our, our refracting amounts from the, from all these calculations here. And so we do convert all these edges to white and the inner part to white for the sake of fall off, as we know there. And then that gets lerped uh, by our power, which comes from one. And so we're basically lerping between, let's preview that. So he says, because this is our final, this is our final um, node here before it gets sent into the refraction. So you can see there, power is at one. And so we're using... Um, I think we, we should be using the, uh, where are we, power, power. But that's zero. Now let's check it out. Okay. So I think we should, that's all, yeah. And so zero is using A and then one is using B. I'm I always forget which, um, which value in LERP uses A or B because I'm freaking stupid. <laughs> Um, but when we put in zero power, as you can see, zero goes into our alpha, and then we use all of, all of A, and A is just one, and so that does interest me, because one going to refraction seemingly gets rid of all the refraction, so I, I'd have to look back at exactly how refraction works, but I mean this, that when you, if you guys get into distortion, look up exactly what, how the values um, you know, for integers affect refraction, because I'm pretty sure that it's got some interesting, um, interesting, uh, how do you say it, uh, reactions in those values, specifically because you can see that I put in one, goes into refraction, and then there's none of it. Whereas when you go negative 50, there's a lot of refraction, and uh, I guess we can just test that out real quick and go to positive 50 and see what happens. It's just bright, but there's still going to be no refraction, is my assumption. 
So anyway, if we did, uh, oh, well, sorry, that we, we weren't actually looking at the refraction when I did that. Um, power's at zero. Okay, so we're getting all this. Let's turn that to 50. That compile takes forever, and we're seeing nothing. And yet if we did negative uh, 50, would we see something? No. Interesting. Okay. Well, sadly, it's been a month, so I can't explain to you guys exactly, but but there's the ideas for it, though, if you need it. Um, if, and if you want to look it up, then you know at least some of the background there where the refraction does react differently. It's different than opacity. That's for dang sure. So this is the whole thing. If you want to literally just copy it and recreate it, um, you'd see it all here. The uh, divide is... <laughs> The second value for that divide is coming all the way from our um, put max particle size here because um, that's our particle divide. But you can kind of see that dynamic dynamic power, but dynamic uh, parameters right there. Uh, so this is the whole ring distortion, um, which is <laughs> such a freaking... It was, it was a hard one. It was, it was a hard one, but uh, and it still is hard. I, I wish I kind of reviewed it a little more, but that's all right. Um, ring distortion instance. Let's go over just the normal distortion real quick. Um, different than ring distortion, obviously, this is more of a, uh, and let's, uh, can we expand this? This is more of, like I said, more of a, like a heat distortion, maybe something that sits above your fire, for instance. Um, so it's kind of made in that, in that regard, but you can kind of see that there. Um, but it's very similar, very, very similar. Um, you kind of see, just get the normals we want again. Um, get mask normals and use them to influence refraction if we want. Same exact thing, split the component. Um, bring that over. Split the component uh, for the normals so you can get black and white values and then multiply that to your refraction amounts. Um, and then lerp that for if we actually want to use the dang thing or not. Um, and then this is just our normal uh, sphere mask. We don't have two masks this time, so I didn't make this whole separate like area for it. Just one super simple sphere mask um, for our uh, refracting area. And so anyway, that gets slurped in here. White for fall off, so we can easily um, kind of um, have that fall off. Let me go into our uh, particles as well here. Particle. Uh, so, oh, sorry, never mind. Not our particles, are our materials. Mats, here we go. <laughs> We want our ring distortion. Uh, nope, nope, nope. M distortion. Do we have... Uh... I'm trying to find the instant. There it is. Distortion instance. Boom. So this is the... We can just mess around with this. Um, but basically, we have the... We, and this, I, <laughs> I even programmed this in because I was using it. But uh, we have our uh, vertical fade. And so this is... If you had fire... Um, you can have the it kind of slowly start to fade out. Um, as is that even working? The flip. Huh. I'm pretty sure that's not working correctly. <laughs> that's weird. Hmm. Well, let's look at that. Uh, so anyway, white for fall off and then all this normal stuff. Um, I move, So this is where things get a little interesting. Um, the difference between that, that ring distortion and this normal distortion, once again, I was, I had a vertical fade here. And, um, but uh, let's see here. I have a vertical fade input. It's not. Okay. So this, this, this uh, probably has something to do with that. <laughs> I, uh, what I'm assuming is that if I put our power in here, give that a 1, let's see if we can... Do I have to save that? Because what's happening is this is my dynamic parameter for my emitter. So as I have this default value of 0 and then change that in the emitter, the... Uh, 
you know, that's going to influence the, the vertical fade here. Um, we have this if function. So anyway, this, this is, uh, I do wish I reviewed these because these are some big boy materials. Ooh, and it's been about a month since I've looked at these. But basically we're using an if um, and we're determining if we're using, if we have a 0, 1, or 0, uh, then we'll determine basically the, the alpha for our, for our LERP here, and which basically says whether we're using um, this value here or whether we're using our vertical fade value that's actually in our distortion instance. And that's actually the reason why this isn't working. But... <laughs> Um, I'm trying to remember if that was just for, um, I'm trying to remember exactly, um, how to do that, but that's, that's how that's going down. Um, I really want to run through this stuff quick, but at the same time, I want to show it off to you guys. So I need to kind of get that refresher on, uh, on me. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I guess we'll move on. Um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to remember how I um, use this if function, <laughs> but but nonetheless. Um, and then so, but it's just a matter of having these dynamic parameters. This is what this does influence our instance and, and kind of the influence instance, the influence the dynamic parameters there. But anyway, that's all that is. Um, static bool. This, this is a kind of interesting and I, I want to show these off to you guys, but this is just a denormalized to range. Uh, you can copy this as, if you want. This is a uh, material module that I made. And this, this is actually really helpful. I don't know if, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is already a module in Unreal, honestly. I, uh, I I didn't find anything specifically, so that's why I, I have that there. But uh, I've actually got two of these. Let me let me drop the other one in real quick. Um, let's go to materials here, and I'm in the, another tab here. Um, go to functions, or sorry, functions, not modules. <laughs> And uh, we've got a normalized range, which I have here. And I also made this one. You can copy this as well if you need. Uh, normalized to range and denormalized range. And what these do, and it's super helpful, um, and I'm, I put these together, but basically, normalized to range, normalize any number to a custom range, 0 to 1 in uh, output. And so this will take a, a custom range you can give it. Uh, you know, you could do like 0 to 100 as your custom range, and then you put in an input, it can be anything, let's say 50, and then it'll output 0 0.5. Um, so this normalizes uh, to a custom range, and then you can clamp the input as well to the range, so then you don't put in 150, and then you get uh, 1.5, right? So it'll clamp the range, then you input 150, it clamps it to 100, so you just get 1. Um, so that's this, no, that's this um, function here. Really helpful, really cool, and I use this a lot. Um, but bring and then this function here, denormalized to range, is the other one. And so what this does is it turns a zero to one input, so something like that could come out of here, turns a zero to one input into a given range, and then the inputs basically saturate, which means it it stays within the given range. Um, uh, though <laughs> explaining what saturated is. I have to remember correctly. I think saturated, yeah, just clamps the value to zero and one. So that basically just normalizes it like immediately. But anyway, clamps the value to zero and one. Saturate is a zero to one clamp. So you don't actually have to go and get a clamp um, and put in those values anyway. Um, so all we're doing here is uh, denormalizing this uh, kind of zero to one input into a given range. And so I can also use, and this is what this is uh, true. So use negative A and B of input. So what that means is that all we're doing is, and I literally have a thing here that explains it, if true, uh, then 0 0.2 will be uh, 0 0.8. So that's all this is, is that uh, this use negative AB uh, of, ab ne use negative absolute of input. Uh, so we subtract, we just get our value, subtract one, and then <laughs> use the absolute value and put it in there. 
So that's all that is. Um, but then we take that, uh, and so whatever that zero to one input is, uh, we got our minimum and maximum range here. So it'll be within 1.5 to five, and then that gets count and that comes in here, and that will control our vertical fade. Um, and we'll make a make a two kind of vector float, so then it can have the uh, of the texture coordinate. Um, so we can kind of have that vertical fade co vertically come upwards uh, from our bounce. And so the thing is, is that I'm explaining all this vertical fade stuff, really showing you guys it. Um, and this is a box mask, not a uh, sphere mask, and that just makes it easy for um, for me to have like this kind of slide, have the box slide upwards um, and actually encompass the whole thing versus a sphere, which <laughs> would not do that. Um, but anyway, box, uh, box mask gets applied to our other mask, you know, and then that gets applied to everything else, which inevitably will um, <laughs> influence the way it comes out. Uh, let's zoom in here. So let's, uh, I want to get the vertical fade to work for you guys, honestly, because I want to show, show it off, but it is influenced by this dynamic parameter. I'm trying to remember exactly, um, how that influence is, comes about here. Um, So let's let's do a default value of one here, and then let's do one. There you go. Okay, there it is. <laughs> um, I just had to take a second to to cool my head off and remember how ifs work. <laughs> anyway, um, basically, if this value in here vertical fade, which is only zero or one. If it is zero or one, or specifically if 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 A is greater than B here and, and B is zero, uh, and you can literally see that uh, the way the if works in the in the material is that the B is B is whatever this is zero, A is whatever this is one. Um, if A is greater than B, then I think output A if I'm right or no no sorry this is the this is the the alpha. Um, So yeah, I think I think output A, right? I have to remember. I don't remember exactly what this outputs. So if we do uh, start previewing, yes, output one, and then if it's zero, output zero. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that'll just output um, whichever one we have there. Okay. Um, but so let's make sure we put that to one, so that we get our B. And our B will determine how much our vertical fade is. So it's really freaking hard to see right now. <laughs> Admittedly, it's really hard to see right now. But uh, if I kind of have this vertical fade, and you can kind of see as I increase this. That it, well, so that's the problem is that it's not, uh, it's not exactly the, the most real time thing here. I, let me see if the uh, let's put this to um, put this to one by default. Let's save this. Let's go to our instance. I'll, I'll, I'm wondering if this is more if this is real time for us. Wow, this is taking a while. I don't know why my computer's eating it. <laughs> but it uh, maybe it made because of the stream. I'm gonna blame the stream. Um, let's go in here. And vertical fade. Let's put that to zero. Okay. So now you guys should be able to to witness this. Um, so vertical fade. Let's see if we can. Okay. No, it's not. It's not gonna. I'm not sure I can get that in real time for you guys. Dang it. Because I want to show you. I want to show you guys working in real time. Because because uh, in the emitter. You know, you can change it real time and it works nice, but but I'm having trouble showing that to you. I guess we could just go by by values here. Um, point. Let's do point two. Um, it has to render every time. Ah, 
That's killer. 0.5. And you kind of see that now it's gone and it's only got a certain part. Um, so I want to show you guys, because it, it's so hard to see the refraction, I'm realizing uh, <laughs> right now. It's really hard to see that. Let's just show you the um, the mask. So let's preview the end here. Um, and you could see right here, so this is all white. But as we, let's do 0.5. Should start to see some black. There you go. And so you can see that it, that'll slowly get rid of the refraction. It'll slowly remove that effect, making the material, um, you know, un, making the material invisible. So what happens is, let's point that to point eight, is it is a vertical fade upward. And so now it, it fades most of it, and then at, at one it fades all of it, and then at zero or you know point two it fades uh, very little of it. And so that's what the that's what the vertical fade does. Finally, finally got that across. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it just allows me to have, and and it allows me to have an effect over fire where if I have fire occur, then it can fade. It can fade in with a vertical fade, but more importantly and specifically, it can fade out. And the reason why I have that fade out like that with this vertical fade is that I want to have it so that the the heat distortion that's coming off this fire slowly gets smaller as it fades upward and then eventually disappears because if you didn't do that then you'd have the entire texture the whole material or particle in this case um, the whole thing would float upward and uh, the only way to decrease its size seemingly making it feel like the heat is going away would be to decrease the particle size which would squish and scrunch the the texture and the material um, and it just wouldn't look right and so that's why I have this vertical fade built into the material so then it has this natural fade away as it floats up where that heat that constantly goes up will go up and then fade out and so that's what this vertical fade does and so that's why I do this for the kind of the general normal distortion which I consider to be heat distortion more or less and so that's all this and and so you can kind of see vertical fade just default zero like that um, so this is the whole thing if you guys once again want to just copy this um, for anybody who wants to do this kind of stuff but doesn't want to go through the hassle of making all these things these are pretty dynamic like I've said I, I tried to do my best to make them dynamic I mean I've got um, all these parameters here some have tool tips some don't I wish I put tool tips on all of them but anyway um, so that's that's all these distortions. That is the large part of of that is probably one of the biggest part of this um, um, not the biggest part of the explosion, but one of the hardest parts. We'll put it that way. It's like one of the hardest parts of this explosion was getting all these uh, materials and distortions right because honestly, uh, <laughs> I'm not the best at materials, but you can see that I've really, pushed myself um, to make some cra pretty crazy materials for the sake of this. And uh, materials are super cool, but quite frankly, Niagara and materials go hand in hand. So if you're going to learn one, you got to learn the other. And uh, that's one of the things that I've had to do. Uh, so anyway, that is the... Uh, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That is the ring distortion. This one emitter, the materials and uh, the textures, which are pretty straightforward, just some normals. Um, have taken up a large majority of this stream at this point. Goodness gracious, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, but I did want to get as much across as I could. And so, anyway, uh, that's that. That's that one part. So we've gone over flash, we've gone over um, ring distortion. Let's go over the next part. And this is the debris. And this stuff is really cool. Um, maybe, maybe, uh, let's do sparks because it's simpler. And then let's do our debris. Let's so we'll come back to debris and, and all that stuff. So let's go over sparks. Let's isolate that and de-isolate this. And let me get a drink of water real quick, cause I am dying. Okay. So sparks, as you've obviously been looking at sparks in the in the left this is 
<laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. It looks pretty cool. Um, as you saw in those previous videos with the the VFX React and uh, and even with just the Battlefront explosions and all these things, the, those sparks are what I was looking at. And I like to reference those things because the, those sparks look fantastic. And it's what we've come to expect from video games and Hollywood. And it's what we've come to expect when we have uh, visual effects happen is, is have those bright, long, streaking sparks and um, all these cool almost firework kind of stuff in Battlefront 1's effect. Oh, jeez. Oh, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I have these really cool looking sparks. And so I've tried to do that here. Um, and we can kind of see how those fly out. Um, it's got a pretty decent amount to them. Um, you have to understand, looking at Battlefront 1 specifically, and we'll, we'll reference this more than anything else, um, the sparks coming out of here, Battlefront 1 specifically, has a lot of different, um, I'll put it this way, they have like multiple emitters, they have multiple um, bursts of these effects going off, um, when it comes to spark, when it comes to fire, when it comes to smoke, and you can see that if we just um, kind of scrub through this right here, as it starts, you can see these three tendrils of smoke come out, and then burst upward like this. Um, and so that's just a really obvious example, but it's the same thing for their sparks and for, I think, their fire as well, where they have multiple of these emitters. And I just say that to preface the fact that I didn't do that. <laughs> it's different from the way I did it. And um, I, I guarantee you that their way is probably, be that their way is frankly better. I mean, they've got professionals working on it, and it does look better than my thing, in my opinion, even though mine is different. It still looks good, but anyway... Um, but I've, I've specifically just used kind of one emitter for all my stuff. If I was trying to make this professional level quality, I would definitely make multiple emitters. I'd make multiple spark emitters, multiple of the smoke and fire emitters. But for the sake of demonstration and just kind of getting the effect done, I've, I've only used single emitters and tried to give them as much variety as possible within just one emitter. And so let's go into our sparks with that, uh, context, um, because they have, like, um, in the Battlefront 1 explosion, they have, like, lots of different types of sparks. They have, like, firework sparks and, like, firecracker kind of sparks going off. Um, and I wonder if I can try and kind of show you. Like, like here, you got, like, these streaking sparks that fly out and have sparks. So lots of different um, emitters they, they have going off while I'm just using a single one. Um but let's go into this. So we've got a spawn. I got, um, once again, variety. So this is this is a big part of just Niagara and VFX in general is um, usually professional effects like the Battlefront 1 one will have this, this random integer amount actually, I, I assume, way lower. Um, I've added a lot of variety to my one explosion effect here in all of my emitters, um, which is probably not a professional way to go about it because it means that I have far less control over how something looks in the game because the computer is who I'm giving control to to randomize all these different aspects of the explosion, of the effect. Um, and so that's a big thing that I've done in, in my explosion that's different from the Battlefront 1 explosion um, where I, I've really let randomization control a lot more of it than probably anyone should um like i said professional effects you'd probably have a lot more control for the sake of making sure everything looks good all the time consistently but uh, anyway um but i so anyway so i have a uh, random of uh just kind of 100 200 sparks um velocity and cone and uh this is where things are a little cool and if you don't know about these this is something that i uh <laughs> kind of learned later on in my niagara a journey but um, this is really great is that um, when it comes to randomizing values and having random input of course you can use the basic grab an integer and then add the uh, random range int right which is what I have here but one of the great things is, and this is something just a trick that you know seems obvious but it isn't to someone starting out is that of course you can use you can go in and get a float curve and this is something that usually by default is is um, going to be something that uses normalized age in order to determine values from the start of a of a particle being alive to the end of its life. Um, but you can 
you can literally change that curve index. And here in velocity, in add velocity and cone, I have a float curve with a curve index that's actually a random integer range. And you can see right here, I just have a maximum of one, minimum of one. See here, minimum of one, or minimum of zero, and a maximum of one, minimum of zero here. And so all that does is, is I can say, I want my particles to grab a random number along this float range. And that allows me to have a curve range. And so it allows the particles, specifically in this, in this effect, most of the particles will be within the range I've given. This kind of five, this, this 550 to kind of 600, 700-ish uh, range. Um, but as the number goes up, fewer particles are going to be shot out at these extreme um, velocities, such as 900 or 800, etc. And so that allows for, for some cool variety to occur and some more variety to occur within the, within the explosion of uh, sparks here. Makes it seem more realistic, of course, right? Versus all the sparks having the exact same velocity or all the sparks having um, the exact same variation in velocity. And I say that specifically because if I, instead of having a flow curve, had the normal um, random integer range and I say a range of 550 to 800. Yes, it'll choose, every particle will have the same choice between 550 and 800. And that actually, like our, our brains are kind of wired. We can notice that, that, that consistency within the range there. And so it's something that, especially when you're working with particles and when, you're, when you've done this a lot, like I've been, like I've done, <laughs> I've done this a lot at this point. Um, you, you can see the consistency between random values. So that's where this curve comes in to really to really shake things up and actually make it really hard to see a, a specific consistency between the random values is having a couple, uh, uh, just a few particles get flung out. <laughs> and it really helps when it comes to only using one emitter, like I was talking about, um, is to do this kind of stuff with your random values. So anyway, that's, that's, that's a great technique to, to, to really add the... the variety there. Um, and then we got some normal gravity force collision. Um, if you notice, well, you have, you might have not seen this, but uh, anyway, what happens is that the, the sparks in the Battlefront 1 effect don't have any collision. You can see them just fly through the ground. <laughs> um, and that's totally fine. Um, I wanted collision personally because sparks don't just magically disappear usually they hit the ground and then they fade out pretty immediately they'll lose their heat um excuse me um so i have collision there um pretty simple stuff just tweak all these parameters get them to a point where they seem realistic to how sparks would bounce how they would um move across the ground with friction all these things uh you can kind of see this here and i'll scrub through it a little bit um but that's all i've got there and then uh, some sale stuff. I have a scale, and so this is a big one. This is a big one right here is scale sprite size by speed. And all we're doing is that I'm giving it a velocity threshold for the, this is the max velocity threshold. And so basically what's happening is that you'll give a, uh, you'll basically give it a, a scaling factor of the minimum scale of what the particle will be at at minimum velocity. And they'll get of a maximum scale when it'll be at maximum velocity, which is this right here, the velocity threshold. And so we can scale um, basically this using this curve here, the, the scale factor uh, threshold for, for those velocities. And so depending, and this is the, the scale factor for the velocity threshold here. So we have a zero, and you can actually read this if you want, but at a speed of zero, the minimum scale is applied, and then at the velocity threshold, the max factor is applied, like I said. And so what happens is that the scale factor influences that. So zero is going to be our zero, and then one is going to be our max uh, velocity threshold. And so this is not a particularly impressive curve. I grant you that. This is actually... <laughs> I don't even know if you even need this at that point, but it's extremely simple. And all it is is that as the, as the velocity threshold goes up, the um, the maximum uh, size will go up as well um, to meet that. And so that's all this is. It's, it's nothing particularly fancy, and frankly, maybe I, I probably don't even need like a, a float curve for this scale value. But anyway, 
Um, so that's all this is. But this is super important as a module in this emitter. Um, as you can see, the, the, the sparks here are, as they fly out, they are, um, you know, they're very, uh, how do you say it? They're very long, elongated. Um, and that's because of this module. If we turn this off, and then take a look at this, you're going to see they're all just literally just tiny, tiny specks. And they look like individual sparks. If, you, if we zoom in here, you can see they look like a spark, like in real life. Um, but as they're flying through the air, you kind of want to create this. Um, and so, uh, sorry, just to go back. Um, they look like sparks like they do in real life. And the reason why I want them to look like that is when they hit the ground, when they run out of velocity, that's how they should look. They should look like a spark. Um, but while they're flying through the air, this is why this is so important, this scale sprite by speed, is because now they look like sparks flying through the air, right? And I only say that to the extent that looking at this, this VFX video, this is what I'm referencing, is you see that these sparks flying through the air have these just super long tails. And this is what we're used to seeing. Um, and then as the sparks lose, kind of lose in their velocity, I, you know, they they the uh, they get smaller. They almost look like a little tic tac kind of thing going on here. If you see some of these, almost look like tic tacs. So they get smaller. And so the reason, uh, my assumption for the reason for this is is just uh, it's a it's a matter of camera capturing. So f you know, frame rates and how fast you can actually see a spark is going to determine, um, you know, where it moves from 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 this point. To this point in one frame but anyway it's just what we're used to seeing even if it's not necessarily <laughs> what's going on um and so and so that's how i've done it here and that's how i've tried to replicate it here um the color pretty straightforward i mean we could do some crazy stuff with color but super straightforward it's just a color curve and uh, we're going from bright white to orange as the color as the spark gets older and once again, that's from that that's from that Bo-Katan video. That's from the behind the scenes stuff where I'm seeing real um, spark effects going off in these TV shows or whatever. And these bright white sparks, and, and you know what? I'm just gonna pull it back up. These, I mean, these are just bright, blown out white. Like, so it's completely white. But then you notice as the effect gets older, the color gets a little more defined, and it becomes more yellow. It becomes more orange. Becomes more red. And so that's what I've tried to do, um, is have this bright white kind of blow out and then have it come down to a kind of more red, orange, or yellow color um, to, to mimic that. And I think it looks pretty good. I think it works out really well. Um, then I have just the normal default parameters. The, these are my, I say normal because the, the usual way I'll use default parameters is just with emissive and just with opacity. Um, Unlike the uh, distortion, where the default parameters have got some pretty interesting stuff, that's the usual way I'll just use them as just emissive and opacity. So anyway, we have a, the normal default parameters, or, uh, or uh, dynamic parameters, sorry, uh, where the emissive power is super high, and then as it goes down, it'll go down to 100 um, as its life continues. So still emissive, but a little less emissive. Um, and maybe, honestly, we could kick that up to maybe 150, but anyway. And then opacity, um, at half its lifetime, it'll start to fade out and then go away. So simple stuff, simple, simple stuff. Um, we can look at the sprite inst. I, I don't think it's particularly impressive. We got a hardness and a radius. Um, I think, if I'm right, because the hardness and radius just for the, the um, just for the sphere mask here. Um, I think if I'm right, the uh, this is based off of the normal Unreal default particle, and I just kind of changed it up a tiny bit. Um, but what's happening is that I'm, I'm basically using this, uh, the, the Unreal's default particle and kind of adding this, uh, some different, um, what do you call it, random, if, do I even have that here? Uh, wait, do we have random values? Hmm. Actually, I'm not sure. I thought I, I had random values for that, but uh, 
I might be really, really dumb here. Huh, I really, I honestly thought that I had, um, just don't we have that particle random? Oh, I don't know if that, I honestly thought I was using this node in here, but I guess not. That's kind of weird. <laughs> anyway, um, sphere mask uh, allows me to just kind of uh, change the way it looks a little bit, and um, allows me to just kind of manipulate the particles to have these different... Um, these different sized particles and some different looking particles for every individual particle. Um, I think maybe in a different one I might have been doing that even more so because I don't see random in here. Um, but anyway, um, pretty simple, super simple. You could, I mean, <laughs> you can all see it right there. Very simple. Anyway, so that is Sparks deisolate. So let's go into some of the other cool stuff, and then we'll go into um, kind of. So this is you know. We're going into some of the more fun stuff right now. So let's let's show off the the this one's really cool. So I have two different types of 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 debris. Um, so let's go into particles, emitters, bases. Um, and so you can see here that I have debris mesh base, and I have debris texture base. Um, and you can see all the other ones. I have all these explosion smoke and. I have normal smoke and particle base. All these are I've I've made myself, but uh, anyway. So let's go into the what was it? Uh, well, I'm just I guess I'm just showing that, but uh, whew, all right, starting to get tired. <laughs> I don't want about that. Um, debris texture base. This one was really cool um, because the whole point of this is that we're trying to use. A buttload, uh, you know, we're trying to have a ton, a ton of debris uh, and little rocks everywhere, and uh, all this stuff, for the sake of adding some, some, some chaos here. Oh man, sorry, I'm really starting to get tired here. <laughs> um, in in if you, oh, I wish I had this video. There is a um, a pack in in Unreal in the Unreal Store, and it's, and I think it's called like um like bullet effects or something. Anyway, that I, that also had a lot of influence on me and it's something that I looked at a lot. Um, but what happens is that when you like shot anything, when you blew up anything, um, all of these effects were just like filled, filled with smoke, uh, debris, just tons of garbage thrown everywhere. <laughs> and um, And it looked fantastic it looked great and so one of the big things that I've I've realized while doing this is that just having this chaos when it comes to destruction is what really adds a lot of realism to it because chaos is what happens when you destroy things in real life and so so I wanted to have a lot of texture uh, I wanted to have a lot of tiny debris um, in this explosion so that's where the texture debris comes in um, later on, I'll go into the mesh debris, which are bigger ones, and those those are kind of interesting, um, even probably more interesting. But these ones are really cool, really simple, but really effective. Um, and I'll go over these in just a second. I'm gonna drink some water real quick. Ooh. Okay. Uh, let's see how the stream's doing. Where are we at? <laughs> We're at an hour, an hour and twenty minutes of how long I've been talking. Gosh, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. There, put in chat. <laughs> Goodness, guys. Well, I think we're pretty close to finishing this up, so let's keep going. Um, so let's go over these textures. So this, pretty straightforward. Sixty or one hundred twenty. Some simple variation. Uh, Spong particle instance. I don't know why it's glitching out. Unreal Five. Unreal Five is in still very very early. So anyway, have some sprite size zero to ten or um sorry four to ten. Simple stuff. Simple stuff. Um, read inertia sphere location. Just have it spawn all in one sphere. Cone. The cone. I I don't know. Hopefully you guys have messed around with cones. Cones are very fantastic. I mean you're able to um. You're able to do a heck of a lot with cones, so just make sure that it doesn't fire. Because um, when you use a, um, a add velocity at, at location, which is a an actual sphere explosion, it throws most of your particles straight into the ground, which is super lame. 
It's <laughs> super lame. It doesn't really work very well. And so a cone allows you to actually have them burst upwards, outwards, and have them not just blow up into the ground. Um, so cones are great. Um, gravity force drag inevitably and then scale sprite size and so this just has the sprite um, as you see very naturally the sprite just fades out um, they all fade out so that's all that is sprite, uh, sprite by size ba boom ba boom 0.6 to, to 1 uh, collision collision once again you got to test this out do do what seems right to you um, you got to make sure that your sparks, your tiny debris, your large debris, for instance, all these different collisions need to make sure that the collisions are unique and apply for that kind of particle. Um, for tiny rocks, for instance, uh, they've got a bit of restitution on there and uh, they've got a lot of friction because I'm trying to slow them down as if they're getting dug into the ground. Um, and then color, color just kind of assign a color honestly this is just allows me to uh, manipulate that however i need and however i want sprite rotation this is very interesting um and so one of the big things that that comes into play when it comes to debris and this 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 comes into play with the texture debris and the mesh debris that we're going to cover in a second is that they need to be thrown out of this explosion i mean they need to be absolutely just just you know <laughs> they need to be blown outward and so what happens is that, um, but when they, when they touch the ground, you know, if they're still rotating while they're just sitting in, in a one spot and they're just rotating, that's going to look insane. It's going to look ridiculous, and, and it does. Um, and, so, and so what happens is that we, I have a pretty simple thing here, um, and this is actually a scratch pad that I made. Um, actually, do I have that here? SDI flip from it, but new. Ah, uh, can I? Okay, I th I thought it was <laughs> with the flip. This is a dynamic input, and I'm not sure why it's not showing up in my dynamic inputs. So I'm kind of tripping balls in that regard. But uh, but whatever, I guess. Um, I I I'm not sure how I can show it to you guys if it's not here. Um. Anyway. That's, uh, okay. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Sprite rotation, and then I have a, a SDI float from Bool. So this is my dynamic input into a splite, in, into the Sprite rotation. And so all this does is my little uh, scratch pad, is, is it does is it takes the Bool of has particles collided. And basically it'll say, if it's true, if it's, if the particle has not collided, if it is false, if the particle is not collided, if it's false, then do this. If the particle has collided and it's true, then set this, then do this. And so the rotation, if it's if the particle has collided, is true, which means the rotation is set to zero, which means it's no longer rotating. Um, if the ro if the um, if the particle ha hasn't collided, which means it's false then we will give it a, a minimum or maximum rotation of 800 or 1100. And so that's all this is. Uh, that's, and that's all the scratch pad custom um, dynamic input does. Um, it, just, it just takes a bool, and then depending on whether the bool is true, it'll give you one of the um, two inputs there. So anyway, that's, that controls the spot rotation to make sure that it stops rotating when it, when it touches something. Because um, it, 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 I'm not going to show you, but it Trust me, it looks real stupid if it keeps rotating when it's not moving. Anyway, so that's as simple as that gets. Um, let's let's uh, make sure to check out our um, our texture here. And this is M texture. It looks like I didn't make an instance for it because I'm stupid. <laughs> but um, particle color, really simple. It just allows me to make whatever color I want. I think in here, um, our color is pretty much just white. So make sure that it, so basically just gives us the default texture. I don't need to make it any darker. Um, but we're just taking that and then just putting it into our mess of color and opacity. Um, this this might be what I was thinking I did with the sparks but didn't do. Um, this is make random sphere masks for more random rock shapes. This is really important in my opinion. Once again, variety is the spice of life, and that's especially prevalent when it comes to explosions and VFX and all these things that are, that are super relevant to to an explosion or an, or an effect. Um, this is literally taking 
at the random values and and uh, you can see that I've, I've set some manual values here um, for the sake of making sure that it's not too random. Inevitably, you, you set manual values. But this just outputs random sphere masks. And so random sphere masks will actually um, change the way that the particle is, um, that the particle looks. And so that's one of the things that you notice with some of these particles is that, um, you know, I have different sizes for particles, but look at this. You see that particle looks way different than, and look at this one. This particle looks way different from like some of the other rocks. And so not only do I have random size values and random rotation values, but I also have random sphere masks. So the rocks, I can take a single rock texture, which, which is what I've done. And that one texture can look like a ton of different rocks because I have random masks thrown on them. So it really adds even more variety and makes things look even more different, which is really good. Um, one of the things that, uh, oh, well, and so anyway, so that's that part. Um, so it's really cool. And you notice that I used my, uh, my little custom module here again, um, denormalized to arrange um, in order to, to help out with there. But once again, I don't know if these modules um, already exist in, uh, in Unreal anywhere. Um, modules like them, but... But if you're going to get into materials, um, honestly, these two modules are fantastic. You should definitely, definitely make them yourself. Anyway, um, so going, so that's that's the whole uh, um, debris base here. Um, going into here, you can see also. Oh, I forgot to mention in in. Anyway, right here you can see that the it's velocity aligned. And so this is really important as, as well for, for, for making things interesting and keeping things dynamic and, and uh, having a lot of random nature to it. The velocity aligned allows the particle to be aligned with the velocity uh, and also face the camera at the same time. So um, that just allows the particles to, to um, be facing with their random velocity. So it, allow, it, it just allows things to be a lot more, um, as far as I'm concerned, even accurate to real life. Because a lot of times um, it'll look better when, when something is heading in the direction that it's facing, basically, that the, that the texture faces. And so velocity aligned is, is what's giving it a lot of these um, interesting rotations as well. And I think, um, I'm not quite sure, but it might have some, some other axis rotations as well. But anyway, that's, that's more or less it. Um, but I wanted to mention, I have the same thing going on with the particles, and I forgot to mention that, but velocity aligned and scale sprite by size uh, speed is, are the two things. Those go hand in hand, basically, almost. Um, so, But yeah, you need to have your velocity aligned in order to have that spark effect where the sparks fly out and uh, they're moving in that direction that, that they are elongated in. Um, so that's very important. Um, one of the reasons why they look, look the way they do. Okay, let's go into the bigger debris, the big, big boy meshes. Um, and so you can see that these guys are full-on, like, rocks being thrown out. Um, like, full-on stones. Now, you can kind of, you can see where I'm, I'm, I'm... You saw it right there, didn't you, right? <laughs> where they are still rotating when they touch the floor. And you know how that does look kind of janky. But I've gotten it kind of to the best as I can at the moment. Um, but that's what's going on. And so these big, this is what it looks like. Big, big rocks, big debris. And I'll go over why that is in a second. Here. Yeah, no, um, don't worry about that. Um, so let's, let's just, let's just hop into it. So first of all, spawn burst instantaneous. Just got five to 20, just random. Uh, sphere location, just kind of give it a little spot. Initial, lifetime, it could be anything. Um, gave it some mass, some good chunk of mass, so the, the gravity can handle it properly, and all the, the forces can, can handle that properly. Um, mesh, uh, scale mode, eh, kind of anything. Um, just kind of a little velocity there. Um, in cone, inevitably. Drag, scale mesh, have it disappear. Collision, um, remember, just kind of go through, do what feels right. This is where things start to get interesting. And I wonder if this is... It's still not even in my scratch pad. This is also a custom module. <laughs> um, but whatever. I don't know why they're not in my sketch pad, but... <sighs> Excuse me. But anyway. 
Um, so set uh, SM set rotation velocity. So what's going on here? Let me see if I can I can get this correctly. Is we're taking the uh, the uh, select vector from bool. So we're selecting a vector from a bool. So you're saying if the if they have collided then use basically one of these one of these vectors here can i move this a little bit there we go and and that's if it's if it's false so if if it's still midair if the if the if the particle the mesh is still flying around then give it one of these random um uh, vectors here and then uh, if it has if it has collided true true vector here, you can see it just grabs. Um, man, why is it, everything so nested? Can't see a damn thing. Um, it grab, grab one of these values and bring it down. Um, so basically decrease it to zero and have it stop rotating. Right. So false rotate true don't rotate. Um, the problem is is that I wish I could show you guys, but I can't see the. Freaking my my module isn't here in the scratch pad. I'm kind of bummed out because it's it's here in the. Can I open it up? No, I can't. There, it's it's man. That's just weird that I don't have it in the scratch pad. But anyway, um. But what this does, SD select vector from bool. Um, but more specifically, this this SM rotation vel. All this is in this custom module. I mean, I'm pretty. I don't. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a custom module. Is it's grabbing the the values um, from these inputs here, and it's just applying that to the rotation of the mesh. This is done because I tried multiple times over um, to just get um, rotation to to literally get the these rocks to rotate and they would not rotate i used like rotational rate i used like um add you know mesh rotation um and they would not rotate and so oh uh, something up Kind of wondering what I did. Did I did I mess them up? Anyway, well they're back. Um, but literally, the, literally the meshes would not rotate, and so I made my own custom module to assign their rotation in the particle update to give them this constant rotating, like the texture particles had. Um, and so that's all this does. It takes that these values for whether it's collided or not. Um, and it applies that to the literal rotation of the mesh uh, in the particle update to allow them to have this rotation. Um, admittedly, it says that some, that this module is deprecated, and so this would be interesting. It's always interesting when they update a Niagara because lots of things get deprecated. So this would be cool to look into in the future of at least what this. I don't know what this is, but anyway, well, um, so that that's what just what I'm. That's what this module is. Is it grabs these numbers and sets them to the action and sets the particles rotation depending on these numbers. That's all. Um, because they just wouldn't rotate. I couldn't get them to rotate any other way. For whatever reason, the mesh particles just wouldn't rotate. So anyway, that's all, that's all I did. Um, we got the mesh renderer. Um, I'm unsure where the heck my... Oh, yeah. Oh, where the heck my mesh is. There it is. All right, here's the mesh. Uh, real simple, it's just a little mesh from one of the uh, effects packs. So anyway, it's it's pretty straightforward, but yeah, the rotation I was having trouble with, so I had to make my own module. That's it. Um, so that, and then the main, and then one of the big things here is that I have a collision event, and so what's happening is I'm generating a collision event, and then I have a receiver, an event handler that receives that collision event, and this is my other uh, emitter, and we can just turn this on because let's have them on in tandem. Uh, this is actually my dust emitter. 
Um, and so this is my dust base, and, and this is pretty simple, but let's, you can check it out in here. And what happens is that anytime these big rocks hit the ground, it kicks up dust. Um, this doesn't happen with the small rocks. Um, it totally could, but I just, I don't think it's necessary <laughs> at all, or else that would be a lot of dust. Um, but this just kicks up some dust every time these big rocks hit the ground. Um, and it, it looks pretty, it looks pretty sweet. It's, it's, a, it's a nice addition. Um... But what happens is 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 I there's a zero spawn count on that because it's gonna spawn um, it's gonna be spawned by um, by the collision of these of this of the particles in this emitter. Um, so anyway, velocity and cone just for the just for the dust, uh, pretty simple stuff. Um, initial particles, pretty straightforward. It can, dust can be lots of different sizes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It got a bit of a gray color for the dust, and I can just change the color. Uh, dynamic parameters, I think, are still the default ones that I have are emissive and opacity, as per usual, sprite size. Uh, gets scaled upwards, actually, as it, as it slowly gets uh, less op opaque, um, just as I assume that dust is, you know, dust kind of expands a little bit, and then, and then you don't see it anymore. So that's just kind of how I did it there. Um, and then you got the, the, the event handler, inevitably. Um, Spawn number, right? That's why we have this here, and we don't have the uh, spawn burst instantaneous doing anything. I guess I could actually just get rid of that. <laughs> um, but uh, we just spawn them here um, because this is actually where the collision event will spawn the particles. Um, one of the things to note is that I have the, the in the collision event, I have the, um, the the delay between collision events is 0 0.01. That just then doesn't spam it or uh, anything like that. Uh, but it still gets a lot of dust kicked up by, by having it 0 0.01. And, um, yeah. And let's go into our... Let's go into our material here. Okay. Right, so this is this is extremely safe for it. Actually, this is, I think, one of the text... This is one of the material kind of maps from from one of the packs, if I remember correctly. But it's, it's it, this is super straightforward. It's just um, texture, particle color, multiply, put in the emissive. Uh, dynamic parameters inevitably and then uh, the dip depth fade for the sake of having the smoke or dust who cares whatever fade out the having the texture fade out as you get a little bit closer so anyway that's all that is so dust is pretty straightforward but just a nice cool awesome addition uh, as far as the effects go okay almost done we got two more oh goodness two more <laughs> very long very long but but it's, it's really cool there's a lot to it's a lot of stuff here and, and honestly i'm 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 happy with it. I'm proud of it. And I, want, and I hope that uh, this kind of helps people, other people, as they as they attempt to make this. Hopefully, it makes it faster. Um, so let's go. Let's just just do. Uh, they're both named Smoke. This is actually the fire. Let me let me name this. Um, do explosion uh, fire. Okay, so let's 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 uh, let's just start out with our fire here. Um, so the fire is really really interesting, and I I, I uh, actually I'd love to show you guys kind of the process I went through. Um, so let's de isolate that, and let's show you this guy, which I didn't delete yet, but this was the first this was the first iteration. Um, but I'll go ahead and. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, pull up the uh, explosion here. Okay, so let's just watch this through, and and I want you to kind of focus on the on the flames here, and I'll point out a couple of things. So we'll watch this. See the fire, and it goes away, and there's the smoke left behind. Um, so what's what was happening is, it, or at least what I thought was going on for a while, is that I thought that the they had a single texture, which is the fire. Extremely emissive. Extremely emissive. Um, nice, nice and red emissive. You know, very, very, um, very, very hot in temperature. Um, and I thought that that was one texture that they... Ooh, excuse me. Um, that they had the emissive slowly fade out, and that texture literally was the smoke texture that slowly... Um, it, so the emissive slowly fades out, and then it just turns into a kind of dark black smoke texture. 
That's what I thought was happening, so that the fire and the smoke were the same texture, the same thing. It's just the emissive went down, and then it was a dark smoke that, that you know, came from it. And so you notice that th that's actually my first iteration here. This is where I have the smoke and the fire the same texture. It's bright emissive blast, and then it kind of slowly fades out into this um, smoke texture. I realized after a while that that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and you kind of can see that, and I think this is the, 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 the fact of the matter here, is that those are the smoke that comes after the fire is, in fact, a different texture. And you can see as the fire kind of the, the, the it disintegrates here, that there isn't an, a smoke that follows this disintegration um, exactly. Um, at least not that I think. Like, like there's no there's no defined lines coming from any of the fire. Like especially if you can kind of see there's a little piece of fire right here. And then there's no smoke practically where that is. So I think the textures are just matched up very well very very well and that's that's totally acceptable and, and it's very it's more than a professional thing to do is to be really good at matching up the textures specifically because i'm going to go into this a little bit more later but even these textures are super matched up with how they expand so anyway sometimes it's all about faking it <laughs> uh, actually it's always all about faking it but anyway um so I kind of quickly realized, especially as well, while, while you're just looking at this, this doesn't look right. I mean, the emissive looks great and the smoke looks great, but that transition between them just looks wrong. <laughs> like the emissive goes away and then it's just like an orange texture that you can literally see with your eyes. And you're like, uh, what? Anyway. Um, so I quickly realized that I don't think that that's the... Well, not quickly, but I did realize that that's, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, and so if we go and enable this one, you can see that. And especially this is something that I just did. That's why I'm, I'm kind of really happy about it. But like the way the texture fades out is it, it's just an opacity and the, emissity fade, and the emissive fading out. There's nothing crazy or special about that. Like it's got the same default parameters here. It's emissive and opacity. Um, but then we move to this when, when I realized I think they're separate textures. And more specifically, I looked at the explosion again and, and revisited it. And, and if you look, the flames are practically disintegrating. Like the texture for these flames are disintegrating and going away. Like it's not, it's not opacity. Because the, the, the emissive, the emissive is just as bright as ever, even when there's almost nothing there. The emissive never goes away. So it's not opacity, um, and and the texture is disintegrating, and so it's definitely not opacity. So something's something's going on there. I realized, and uh, and uh, oh, I kind of forgot what I was going to say. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I'm so tired. <laughs> anyway, I got this. I got this. Um, so one of the things, and you, and this is the new fire, and so you can kind of see. Does this look more like the Battlefront 1 fire? Check it out. I think it looks way more like the Battlefront 1 fire. I think it looks a lot better, too. Um, and so you could see that I'm not using opacity and just fading out this texture. That's not what I'm doing at all. Because... As, as with this last one, the, the the original one, the first one I did, you saw that the when the opacity goes down, the um, oh I didn't really mean to click that, um, but anyway, when the opacity goes down, you can see the emissive goes away, and so you can see those orange textures very clearly, and you're like, why the flip am I looking at an orange, two D texture? You can see it, like like the effect is broken, but in this new fire effect. You can see that we don't. I don't have the opacity go down or any of that. The the emissive is kept and it disintegrates, which is a big part of it. So so that's the two main things that the emissive, it, it's always as emissive as it ever will be, and the texture di like disintegrates versus goes away in opacity or anything like that. 
And um, so anyway, that's that's the big difference in, in the new fire that I made versus my first attempt at that. And it looks so much better. Like, I, I hope you guys agree, but this looks so cool. I honestly love it. And I honestly think it looks exactly, if not, it's very similar done to the way that Battlefront 1 did their little disintegration for how they disintegrated their fire. Um, a very similar look to Battlefront. Um, so let's... So spawn burst instantaneous. This is literally just two particles. Um, if you added a bunch more, you'd have a bunch of the same texture overlapping, and it would look like 40 little explosions went off. And so I can literally do that for you. 50. And you can see that at the end there, you have like a whole buttload of these of these uh, little tiny um, explosion entrails. And so that's that's the reason why I keep it at two, but also there's no need for 50 of them anyway. That's stupid. <laughs> the the emissive takes care of it all. Um, but but the reason why there's all those entrails is just because I'm working with one flipbook texture. I don't have a ton of them. You get the idea. <clears throat> Actually, there's one thing I, I hope in Niagara they eventually have use and you can use different flipbook textures. Anyway, one day, one day. Pray. Can you even do that now? I'll, I'll look into that. Anyway. <laughs> Velocity and cone, uh, particle size, pretty simple. Um, so this is this is where something gets, gets interesting. Is in the, and this is where things really do get interesting. And I'll show this off later. The smoke right here. This is my smoke, and this is my fire for my final final explosion. Similar to how Battlefront One, I assume did it and does it. This is my assumption. Is that these two things go hand in hand, and they are manually. Um, set to to work together well and that's exactly what I had to do here is I was constantly tweaking the the size of these particles the rotation rate of these particles and the the um, and the uh, the uh, this the scale sprite size of these particles in order to get the fire and the smoke to overlap and make it look like the fire disintegrated and the smoke was left in its place um, and so this is something that's done in my assumption all by just manually tweaking and getting it to look right um, you might be able to do more dynamic stuff by having the fire go away and then spawn in smoke particles um, I'm sure there's there's you could do that and there's many ways to do it but I think this is the main way of, of going about it if not one of the one of the good ways of doing it is just get get the necessary things that need to go hand in hand and then manually tweak them to make it happen. Um, so anyway, that's that's why I, I bring that up because that that's where this rotation rate comes in and that's where this sprite size comes in. It's because all this stuff goes hand in hand with the explosion and with the smoke. Um, and it's all manually tweaked to make sure that it all fits together like a perfect puzzle. Um, so anyway. Velocity and cone sphere, a uh, little sphere radius. Give it some, give it some area. Uh, gravity force, gravity force. Of course, it's going upwards, so I get it a plus eighty, just to have it kind of slowly go upwards. Um, drag a little bit, of drag there. And color, throw on color. I just, actually, I'm not sure if this one even gets used, but it might. I don't, I don't remember. I think it actually does. We'll we'll look at that in the when we look at the um, the material. UV animation, simple stuff. Um, flipbook, zero to one. Have it loop through it once throughout the lifetime. Uh, sprite scale. Once again, um, I might talk about this a little later, but but uh, as the explosion goes off, it increases very quickly, and then it kind of has a slower increase. And then dynamic parameters, um, fade out mask. This is part of the. Uh, this is part of the interesting. Oh, so, ooh, wee. Oh, man, excuse me, I'm very tired. This is part of the interesting part about this material and its disintegration effect that's going on here. I just made this effect, guys, literally today, so that's why I'm kind of uh, ecstatic about it because it looks so cool, um, and it works just, just, just perfectly. It works exactly how I like it. And then rotation rate, have it rotate a little bit, give it a little bit of that spice. Okay. Let's jump into the app material. Um, pretty simple texture and then emissive color for the instance. Let's jump into the material. Um, also, really straightforward. Um, if you notice, it's it's pretty much the same as that other just like dust, like really simple dust. It's just get the get the emissive, multiply it, multiply that, um, um, get the particle color, multiply it by the texture, 
put it into a LERP whether I want to use the emissive or not. And this is because of that other fire effect. This actually all isn't probably super necessary anymore. Um, but this is just because of that previous fire effect where I wanted to have the emissive kind of turn into the smoke, um, which is the normal color. But anyway, I just left it because who cares? <laughs> uh... <laughs> but uh, but in order to do that, I guess if you wanted to still do that, this is how I did it. Is I got my normalized to range. Uh, how strong the emissive is determines how much of it we use. So when I put in a really powerful emissive, we'll use that emissive. When the emissive goes away and it turns into normal smoke that doesn't have an emissive like fire does, then it actually doesn't use the emissive anymore. So if the emissive is a lot, we'll actually use the emissive. If, as the emissive goes down, we use it less. So that's what this is. Um, and then our normal depth fade, so you have to go away. And then this is this is where we have the, the fire fade. Um, my goodness, extremely simple. I know I'm raving about something that's literally just a sphere mask, but sphere masks are sometimes hard to understand, man. All right, give me a break. <laughs> um, sphere masks are so cool, but yeah, they are a little bit boggling sometimes. Uh, Mind boggling. But anyway, so all we're doing here is we're grabbing the, the kind of the end of the texture. And I have no idea why it's not willing to show it to us. That is kind of frustrating. Why the flip won't it show it to us? Uh, okay, whatever. Um, but we just grab the texture, the end of the texture manipulation. And uh, we plug it into a sphere mask. And, and we basically have the sphere mask just slowly um, decrease in radius. So we have a hardness of zero, um, which means that we don't jack around with the texture at all um, as far as how it looks. If you increase that hardness, it will actually start like um, messing with the opacity around the uh, the texture in the flipbook. And so you just, you just keep the hardness to zero, so then the texture looks exactly the same as it needs to. And then you have... Um, just one to, uh, I guess, um, what do you call it, compensate, go against the, the um, texture there. And then you have the radius. And radius is pretty straightforward, but this is our fade out from zero to one. So our zero is, or our one is, it's all faded in. And then zero is it slowly um, increases that mask to the point where it fades out. So anyway, um, but, but that fire fade mask is just great because because it just looks fantastic and so there you go <laughs> so that's all that's all that is that's it's as simple as the the uh the fire goes uh don't worry about it and so that's that um and then our last module last but not least is our smoke so like i said this goes hand in hand i uh, it's pretty much the same thing um i spawn like uh, 16 to 20 I, this is something where, like the professionals probably did, I really brought down the random counts of these particles for the sake of trying to make sure that things stay consistent. Um, you kind of see the smoke in the, in the left going on there. Um, initial size, lifetime, once again, really brought down the randomness. It's, it's super tiny variation. Um, I'm a man who believes in variation, so I still kept variation in there, but yeah, I mean, I'm really trying to, like, nail it down for the sake of keeping the explosion looking good because too much variation in this part of the effect specifically the smoke and in the fire like the the main part of the effect too much variation is going to throw things off um so this is this this is how i assume the professionals do it keep it nice and nice and uh concise um little variation anyway so sprite size way more particles so i have the size is a little smaller than the fire um, but that's also for the sake of trying to have more movement within the smoke versus within the fire. Um, so that's that's part of that reason. Uh, rotation angle, once again, um, I've, I've limited that movement. It's the same thing in here, where um, if, if the sprite rotated like a, like 180 degrees, then, this, then the smoke effect, like that flip book, will literally be upside down, which isn't going to look correct <laughs> when it's rising upwards and the flip book is upside down. Um, and so I, I've, I've given it a lot of variation, but I definitely didn't want it to do a full, a full 180 or else things were really going to start looking real weird. Um, and I, and I want things to stay, to have a lot of variety as the, as most, the, the most variety as possibly can without it breaking the effect. 
So that's what I'm doing there. Sphere location, it's a lot bigger than the fire sphere location. Um, for the sake of trying to have the tiny, tinier particles more encompass the fire. And the, and the cone is a little different, a little more open, but also stronger velocity. Um, gravity, gravity is a, is a full on vector curve. Um, th this is for the sake of, of this gravity has it shoot out a little more and then slowly gets less gra uh, upward gravity. So it's, it's an upward gravity force, by the way, as, uh, as the particle goes along. And then, um, these are just some, some side, some, some side gravity. So it slowly increases in its speed at which it kind of floats away from where it originally exploded. Um, and that's it's a similar thing to how Battlefront 1 does it, where you'll see that the, the smoke at the end here um, slowly is floating off in that direction. Um, and so, you know, I just had a little bit of that as well. So it, it does make it look more realistic, having a small simulation of kind of wind carrying the, the, the lighter smoke away. Color, straightforward color curve. Uh, starts out um, kind of as normal smoke color and then and then pretty quickly starts to make that transition, that long transition of going to black. Um, UV animation, one animation per lifetime, 64 flames, you get the idea. Sprite scale curve, very similar. Um, this is tweaked like with the fire to go hand in hand, um, but they are um, very similar, if not the same kind of expansion rate. Once again, I'll go over why this is important in a little bit. Um, pretty simple, um, emissive, opacity, and then the same fade-out mask that the fire has. I love that fade-out mask, so I use it here a little bit, too. Uh, not as much as the fire, but a little bit, but I still use opacity mostly, or uh, uh, more specifically. I, but they both go hand-in-hand. Hand. Um, and then rotation rate, pretty straightforward, but a little more rotation than the fire for the sake of having it wispy. All right, let's, uh, and that's the same uh, smoke, um, what do you call it, dingus wingus, <laughs> the same, uh, same material as the fire. All right. Um, and so that is it, guys. Finally, how long is the stream? Let's see this. Two hours. Ouch. Ouch. E. I'm going to put two hours in there. Two hours. Um, I'm going to do, I'm, I might talk about a couple more things and then, and then I'll, Call it a day and uh, and uh, close it up here. So let's unisolate that and let's have our full explosion again. Um, so you could see the whole thing back in its glory. <laughs> so it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. I'm I'm proud of it. It's got the, the distortion is great. It adds the whole uh, effect. Maybe the distortion could even be faster. But anyway, like I said, lots of tweaks could be done. Let's talk about what I wanted to talk about there. So when it comes to these, this fire and this, this explosion here, this thing needs to not exist. Um, where are we? Um, when it comes to the, the, the fire and the explosion, sorry guys, I was thinking about something else for there for a second. Um, the, the, Scale sprite size here that I had. Gosh, this the Unreal 5 is still a little glitchy. <laughs> but this is for a reason. I want to show you guys this, and I, and I just find this interesting, and I, I, I do love this kind of stuff. I want to go into audio um, in games, but I do love the effects a whole lot, too. A lot of passion in that regard. Um, but look at how the expansion of the explosion starts, and I want you guys to notice how the fire, how the smoke, how the sparks all expand at the same rate that the distortion around all of them expands and they're all encompassed by the distort by the distortion until a certain point when they all are allowed to expand individually and just notice how that happens from the grenade right here and you'll see oh sorry is that in real time or right. oh, well even that's too fast but let's just do frame by frame look at look at how this works it, it bursts out lots of light but look at how the look at how everything almost expands at the same rate until eventually it gets to its apogee and then the distortion goes away and fades away um, and flies away quite frankly <laughs> and then everything kind of expands at its own rate but look at notice how at the start everything is encompassed within this distortion as it expands that is so, I'm assuming, accurate to real life, and it also looks freaking amazing. And so I, I made a brief and small attempt to do the same thing 
with the expansion of my smoke and the expansion of my fire here. I didn't include the sparks or really anything else in, 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 those, in those attempts to make that expansion uh, simultaneous and, and the same. Once again, because those are the manual um, VFX artist tweaks that come in to really, you know, make that thing professional and make it look amazing. But I, I didn't do that for everything. I just did it for, for the fire and the smoke, the biggest elements. Um, uh, <laughs> because I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, I don't get paid. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll kind of show you guys just a little bit of how I tried to do that. Um, so let's look here as it expands. And I've slowed it down. I've slowed it down. So you can kind of see where the, it, the fire slowly expands. And this, the distortion, if you can see that, is slowly coming out with it. And we can do, and we can look at that again uh, real quick here. And just kind of notice how the, the fire, all that stuff comes out of the same spot. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little hard to notice, admittedly, because um, the sparks are not, like I said, I didn't do anything to those ones or the or the debris or anything. So like the sparks are super in the way and they are not a part of that original tiny expansion. But anyway, you get the idea. And I, and I, and I showed you the concept that I was getting at there. And so that's, that's a really cool thing. Um, it's really amazing and 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 I love that and that's something that I tried to in the smallest amount incorporate into this brief demonstration VFX kind of explosion here that I made <laughs> but I I do love that and so it's something that I do to notice and I take into account um and I and I really really enjoy um it's that's that I got to say I think that's I think that's pretty much everything um, I, I, I'm gonna take a brief moment to just look over and make sure I I got everything I I need to have gotten. But uh, I think that's everything. Um, let me look at the just textures real quick. Uh, particles. So yeah, I mean, just you know, the flash. I have a really simple texture there. I guess it's the heat. Like normals are given. The rock. I just have a simple rock from one of the textures. Flipbook smoke smoke flipbooks. There's tons of them out there. There there really are a ton of them. Lots of free ones. Um, this is the flash kind of texture I used. You do not have to use anything that has any like opacity. You know, it's, you don't have to use like a, a PNG or a, or a, what was the other one like a. a tag or something i forget what the hell they're called anyway you don't have to use any of that you could literally just have a circle and have it super bright because the emissive does all the work anyway um but yeah that's that's about it um i think that's everything i so i'll just span this um so yeah thank you guys for watching uh, i i you know i i appreciate anyone who watches my my videos i don't make anything a whole lot um i i'm i'm trying to get a job in the game industry i'm not gonna lie <laughs> um hey if if i get hired if, if anybody's like hey vfx you can do that i'd love to do that for people um but the main thing i'm trying to do is audio um my last video is me doing reverb effect i'm gonna have another video dropping on the channel in, a, in maybe a day or two that that uh, is showing off an audio demo that is basically done that I made um, but I might just tweak a couple things and then make a YouTube video on it um, similar to my reverb test in the last one but yeah it's a cool audio demo it's in UE5 and and all uh, that'll be dropping in a couple days here um, but I hope I hope this uh, was helpful to people who are trying to make um, an explosion who are trying to make cool VFX and who have I, you know some knowledge of Niagara? I'll, I'll I'll have to put it in the description because I don't think I did a great job of prefacing that this is for people who are who who have some knowledge of Niagara to to an extent, but don't have um, a ton of knowledge. So people who know how to navigate um, Niagara, but but uh, are still looking to start their uh, their <laughs> VFX journey in that regard and. Uh, and make a cool explosion and, and uh, maybe cheat and just copy all of my 
uh, materials, which I'm fine with. Go for it. Absolutely go for it. Um, as long as you learn while you do it, um, that's that's the whole point of this. That's why we make tutorials, and that's why we talk about this stuff. It's all the it's all to teach people, man. Great stuff. Super fun. I'm happy with the explosion. I hope you guys like it. Please tell me if you like it, because I think it's good, and I, I want affirmation because I'm a self-absorbed piece of crap. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope I hope you guys uh, enjoy this, and I hope it was helpful for anyone who's who's looking into who wants to do this kind of stuff or is just simply interested. Um, anyway. Thank you guys so much for watching, and uh, have a great day.